And uh, well, thank you for being here and inviting me. And um, as you see the title of my lecture, Anthropological Perspectives on Home, I thought later perhaps it's more my anthropological perspective on home. But it might be interesting uh, to see how I came to my perspective on home as an anthropologist. I put on my glasses for, I wrote most of it down, and the title of my lecture may suggest that the topic of the home was part and parcel of the anthropological discipline since its inception in the 19th century. But it was not. The topic of the home is in fact a late arrival in the vast array of topics and research areas in anthropology. And when I say anthropology, I mean social or cultural anthropology. But that's a bit too long, and I use anthropology as a shorthand. Anthropology started out in the 19th century as just grand theories on cultural evolution and how society had evolved from a primitive state into the civilized nation state of the Western world. It was only in the beginning of the 20th century that anthropologists were interested in studying primitive societies in reality. They traveled to the far ends of the globe to study exotic tribes and observe their way of life, often without any knowledge of the native language. As anthropologists were in fact uninvited guests, the tribe was as best curious but more often hostile. The now famous anthropological research method of participant observation resulted from the anthropologist's initial inability to communicate in the native language. By careful observation and long-time participation in the tribe's daily life, anthropologists hoped to gain the people's trust and respect. The books anthropologists wrote on their experience and observations were often bestsellers. And now I try to see if this works. Yes, it works. Perhaps a bit less light, for otherwise it will be there. Is it possible to turn off the light? I'm afraid there? that the camera is not going to work very well. With oh, the well, is it so possible to do the light uh, there? We can try it. Yes. Yes, that's much better. Yes, that's much better. Okay. okay. Black or white? No, maybe. No, no. Please turn it down. Yeah. Do you prefer that this way? Yeah. 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 <coughs> well. For instance, Margaret Mead's Sex and Temperament in Three Primitive Societies was a hugely popular book. Of course, the word primitive in combination with sex was the main attractor, for sex couldn't be discussed in the context of American society of the 1950s. This book is from the 1950s, the study is from the 1930s. Studies of so-called primitive societies, therefore I made a scan of the uh, cover, <coughs> this primitive societies, enabled anthropologists to bring topics to the fore that were sensitive in his or her own society. Uh -huh. In the latter half of the 20th century, the research focus shifted more towards rural societies in the West, the Mediterranean and Italy, in particular, was a favorite research field. Fieldwork studies closer to home resulted not only from shrinking research funds, but also from fewer and fewer exotic research paradises left unspoiled by Western civilization. Eventually, our anthropological, anthropological research also incorporated urban communities with an ethnic population. The field of urban anthropology, which emerged in the 1960s, was mainly focused on public space and street life in American neighborhoods, like the famous study Soul Sight by the Swedish anthropologist Ulf Hannertz. At that time, it was considered 
dangerous for white people to enter the black ghetto, only because the anthropologist was not a white American but a white foreigner, he was accepted by the residents of the ghetto. Only because, <coughs> well, seeking adventure and living dangerously was considered part of the anthropologist's profession. You might expect that the research field of the contemporary home, with its focus on private or domestic space, also emerged from urban anthropology, but it didn't. It emerged from a combination of the research interests in rural societies and women's studies. I will come to that later. But anthropologists are not alone in their interest in the contemporary home. Nowadays, anthropologists compete with social scientists who do research on the home. Anthropologists, however, are prone to stress their distinct methodological and theoretical approach. Methods and theories that are rooted in the initial study of the so-called primitive societies. As anthropologists always tend to look for exotic topics, the contemporary home might not be attractive to them, as it may seem a rather dull and boring topic. That is why I stated in my introduction of At Home that the anthropology of domestic space will be a native research paradise illustrating the exotic in the familiar. <clears throat> the exotic in the familiar was a deeply felt conclusion when writing my report on Dutch home life for a French-Swiss marketing firm in the early 1990s. The French marketing firm had approached the Department of Anthropology of the University of Amsterdam to ask if students would be willing to do fieldwork in Dutch homes. In the early 90s, the firm had initiated a large-scale research project titled Anticipating Change in Europe. And in their view, the Netherlands was a country most prone to change, especially where eating habits were concerned. I was asked to coordinate the Dutch part of the research and supervise the six selected students. Although I was very skeptical in the beginning about the willingness of Dutch households to accept a student ethnographer in their home, it worked out rather well. After narrowing down hundreds of households, which were selected by a special agency according to six different lifestyles, each marketing firm works with lifestyles. Probably you know, but <coughs> 60 households were extensively interviewed by my students at the end of the interview, the student had to ask if the family would be willing to have them as an in-house guest, staying in the home for three times, three days. Out of ten interviewed families, at least one family was willing to host the student for nine days. The student had to, had to have a click with the family, for there was, it was all about uh, mutual respect and trust. With the prospect of a small financial compensation, the family had to allow the student to partake in the household like a household member and also allow the student to make photographs of all the details of the interior, including the contents of the cupboards. It was participant observation of the most invasive kind. There was a privacy contract signed to protect the families from overexposure. Anyway, uh, the student ethnographers provided me with their observation reports and with loads of photographs. As a coordinator, I had to make the overall report and turn the separate student reports into a true ethnography of Dutch family life. At first, I was struck by the similarity of these households. Although the six households represented different regions, different household compositions, and different ages, 
the internal arrangement of the domestic spaces looked all very much alike. <coughs> the interiors looked all so familiar, so normal, and yes, so boring Dutch and far from exotic. I realized that to be able to write an ethnography, one needs estrangement or difference. Anthropology as a discipline had thrived on the difference between us being civilized Westerners and them being the primitive others. I wondered how could I create difference or estrangement. <clears throat> when I realized that the families, not all of them, that the families who lived in houses originally built in the 1930s had renovated their houses to look like modern houses on the inside, I knew that time or history could give me the estranging difference. The floor plans of houses built in the 1930s, with a parlor in the front and a dining room in the back, were by its new owners converted into a modern open plan living room, as you see on the right. <coughs> The hallway didn't exist anymore in the renovated houses of the 1930s. Its space was incorporated into the open plan living. Comparing the different floor plans of the 1930s to those of the 1990s revealed not only changed household practices and family values, but also a different relation to the world outside the home. A changed floor plan indicated changed practices. That was stuck in my mind. <clears throat> in reconstructing the household practices of the 1930s and comparing them with the practices as observed by my students, the much needed difference was created. When comparing the present situation with the past, all the familiar arrangements became suddenly less self-evident and even exotic. I had found my native research paradise in the Dutch home. In other words, the historical or temporal comparison was crucial in my understanding <coughs> of present-day Dutch home life and culture. I invented the name anthropology of domestic space not by accident, but as a reference to the structuralist approach of the house in which the ordering of the floor plan of the house reads like a map of the tribe's culture or cosmology. I have to make a detour through the history of anthropological theory to clarify my point. So, hold your voices. <clears throat> the concept of the house as a model or a reflection of a culture was introduced in the anthropological discipline in the 1960s. Both the French school of structuralism and the British school of structural functionalism saw spatial layouts and demarcations as a key to the understanding of a culture. Spatial layouts mirror in this interpretation the way people classify their living environment. <clears throat> in the perspective of the founding father of structuralism, Claude Lévi-Strauss, his name is on the cover, and his initial follower, Pierre Bourdieu, <clears throat> not only the layout of compounds or villages, but also the spatial demarcations within houses mirrored major cultural distinctions and represented as such, such a variation of a number of so-called binary oppositions, common to all cultures. However, implicitly it was interpreted as common to exotic cultures and not our own Western culture. The most universal binary opposition were nature culture, male, female, life, death, dark light, left, right, east, west, and you may be surprised, the raw versus the cooked, which was in fact a derivation of the key opposition between nature and culture. And the role of the cooked played an important role in my comparison between the, the 30s and the 90s. <coughs> the perspective of British structural functionalists, such as Mary Douglas, 
and Clark Cunningham, however, was less bipolar and more focused on the behavior that expressed ritual zoning and symbolic boundaries in and around the house. For instance, the behavior regarding thresholds is a major focus of attention. In Mary Douglas' book, Purity and Danger, mundane household activities like cleaning, sweeping, and polishing are interpreted as boundary marking activities. In both the French and the British perspective, the concept of the house is perceived as the conflation of a spatial and a symbolic structure and acts as a shorthand for a cultural analysis of the symbolic kind. A long sentence. Anyway, the concept of the house lacks, however, and that's very important, the concept of this concept. It misses something. The concept of the house lacks, however, the emotional connotation of home, which Westerners, including anthropologists, find so special about their own dwelling. Going back to <clears throat> Therefore, the switch to the concept of the home in late 20th century anthropological writings is first and foremost explained by a change of research areas. Anthropology was literally brought home to the countries where the academic tradition of the discipline was founded. When the word home popped up more frequently in the titles and publications by anthropologists, it might seem a modern translation of the more traditional anthropological concept of the house, but actually it reflects a major shift within the anthropological discipline. <clears throat> Throughout the 20th century, the academic endeavor of anthropologists has been to find structure in or reason behind seemingly illogical practices, <coughs> beliefs, and behaviors of more or less exotic people, the so-called primitives. The implicit difference and comparison between us and them has propelled the discipline since its inception. One of the assumed and implicit differences between civilized and primitive people has been the idea that only the behavior of primitive people is symbolically motivated. Western people, however, lost the symbolic drive in the course of the civilizing process. While the symbolic perspective was considered unsuitable for the anthropological of urban communities, it flourished in anthropological studies of rural communities in the West, which were perceived as primitive isolates in modern society. <clears throat> as a student in the late 1970s, I was very much interested in the exotic customs and traditions in rural, Dutch rural communities. I did my field work in a village in the north of the Netherlands and studied a seemingly very traditional New Year's custom. To some it was a primitive custom dating back to the Middle Ages. But I found out that the custom was only 20 years old. At that time, the research interests of anthropologists and ethnologists intertwined in their collective focus on rural communities within their own society. Dutch ethnologists, however, didn't like the competition of student anthropologists, while Scandinavian ethnologists were more open-minded. For me, the work of the Swedish ethnologist Orvar Lovgren and in particular, his study of the Swedish home was very influential. And sorry, I don't have a book cover of him because he mainly wrote articles on it. <clears throat> the segregation of the sexes, which pervaded every aspect of traditional rural society, triggered the feminist aspirations of young female anthropologists like myself we wanted to fight <coughs> patriarchal dominance on every level. In bringing to the fore the relation between gender, power, and space, Shirley Ardenas, volume, Women and Space, <coughs> Ground Rules and Social Maps, was groundbreaking. The word map 
in the title is indicative of the symbolic perspective. In combining the symbolic with the feminist perspective, the book characterizes the transition in anthropology of the traditional concept of the house into the modern concept of the home. Feminists saw the 19th century creation of the emotional home centered on female domesticity as the pinnacle of patriarchy. The home was seen as a woman's prison and criticized for secluding women from the public sphere of males. Sorry, I take a bit of water. My present research approach as an anthropology of domestic as an anthropologist of domestic space is not only influenced by feminist anthropology and the study of rural communities, but also by the American critical anthropology of the 1970s. My American professors at the university were representatives of the radical movement of critical anthropology criticizing the colonial attitude of the discipline and the implicit Western superiority. Anthropology as a discipline had to be reinvented and reversed in questioning Western superiority. <clears throat> in this reverse anthropological approach, Western culture phenomena are explained in reference to non-Western phenomena, as described in ethnographies of societies once called primitive. The explicit reversal of the comparison between us and them is the legacy of the 1970s generation of radical American anthropologists. In problematizing Western society and culture, they contributed to the homecoming of the discipline and the practicing of anthropological fieldwork in their own society. Their critical stance towards anthropology's underlying assumptions fostered a modern culture critique in which Westerns had to learn from people once called primitive. It was in fact the resurrection of the noble savage. It is nicely illustrated on the cover of the book by shattering an old photograph of so-called primitive people. <clears throat> the lessons of Critical anthropology became more or less a moral obligation and are reflected in my mission statement of at home, in stating that we as Westerners still express ourselves symbolically in the spatial arrangements and decoration of not only our houses, but also the surrounding public space. Ever since, my project has been to show the relevance of the symbolic analysis in the study of the contemporary Western home. As such, it subverted the notion of all pervasive rationality in Western societies. In the reverse perspective, seemingly mundane household practices such as laundry, cleaning, clearing, are interpreted as domestic rituals restoring symbolic boundaries and meaningful categories. Meaning is created in practices but dissolves when it's not enacted time and again. The homecoming of anthropology and the study of the contemporary home in Western societies also resulted in a revival of material culture studies, which until then had been researched in ethnographic museums or on archaeological sites. Notably, Daniel Miller's Prolific research on consumption practices and the home has inspired, has inspired a generation of European anthropologists in studying the meaning of mass-produced objects in the context of the home. Miller captures the power of individual consumers in the concept of appropriation. In opposition to the powerless concept of alienation in Marxist, rhetoric. Individual consumers buy and appropriate mass-produced objects by incorporating them into a domestic universe of personal meaning. In consumer studies like these, the concept of identity is often presented to designate the individual character of the creation or appropriation, while the essence of concepts like identity and also style refer to their social character 
and as such transcend individual homes. However, the complexities of identity creation in relation to the home is best exemplified by migrants, who not only define in decor and furniture the difference or similarities between the host society and themselves, but also redefine the relation with their home country and its tradition vis-a-vis -vis host society. Anthropological studies of migrant homes mainly focus on material expressions of the migrants' native identity as displayed in decor and furniture and to a far lesser extent on the use of domestic practices or domestic um, spaces which demand a prolonged participant observation in the home. Although I very much like the type of research Daniel Miller is doing, I am a great fan of his research, really. I have a more, I personally have a more historic approach of material culture in the home. For instance, in my research on 20th century history of the Dutch interior decoration, that was another research later, I used objects as a lens for changes in Dutch society and cultural ideology to show how furniture preferences were determined by class-related ideas which were created over a long period of time. <clears throat> and in my research on children in the home, I used the change design of the objects of the playpen. Do you know what a playpen is? I Do you know what the, the playpen is? I, I think it's a rather typically Dutch. Do you know what's the? Is there a playpen for what for children in the house when you have a, a uh, box? A box, box. Yeah. a box. kind of box. Right. Okay, we call we also call it a right. box. It's it's uh, uh, the English never call it a box. So uh, the word is also in Dutch box, mm -hmm. but uh, playpen. And I use this the change design of a simple ob like object like the playpen. Uh, to illustrate the changed position of children in Dutch homes. In my historic approach of material culture, I depend on photographs or illustration to prove my point. Like historians, I use image archives and printed illustration. I made this short detour through the history of anthropology to show that a new research area of the anthropology of domestic space <coughs> has reinvigorated old school anthropological research within the contemporary setting of modern homes and urban living. Anthropology, however, in competition with other disciplines researching the home, has to stress its unique selling point and focus on the discipline's core issues of meaning and meaning creation, more in particular the personal and cultural meaning of the home. I take. <sighs> Before addressing the multiple di dimensions of the personal meaning of home, the cultural meaning of home should be addressed first, as its history sheds light on several dimensions of the personal meaning of home. Your research project into the meaning of home for migrants has everything to do with the personal meaning of home. However, personal meanings are also molded by cultural notions which might be very different from Western notions of home. <clears throat> the cultural meaning of home in the West, in the West is molded by the 19th century history of industrialization and subsequent urbanization. At that time, Large numbers of rural workers came to town in search of a factory job. With a rising population of factory workers and great numbers of rural people looking for work roaming the streets, towns and cities became overcrowded. Especially the situation in English cities was alarming. Social tensions boiled up to a revolutionary spirit sparked by the writings of Marx and Engels. The middle classes were anxious and felt the need to protect their women and children from the turmoil. 
the societal unrest in the 19th century city initiated not only a spatial but also a mental split between the domains of home and work. That's cultural meaning, the difference between home and work. Spatially, it gave rise to suburbia. When the Victorian middle classes built their family homes outside the city in the green suburb. The suburb is in fact the cradle of the cultural meaning of home. As such, it was a new interpretation of the then dominant spatial and moral opposition between town and country. <coughs> a home in the suburb was seen as a safe and moral haven for middle class families, but in particular for women and children, who needed to be protected from the unruly and revolting mass of urban workers. In due process, the city became a man's place of work with banks and offices. The spatial separation of the places of home and work not only resulted in distinct gender domains, but also evolved in distinct economic domains very different value systems and codes of behavior. Home was the woman's place reigned by the non-profit values of caring and sharing, while the domain of work was the male territory reigned by cost efficiency and commercial values of profits and losses. These contrasting value systems became more and more expressed in different languages of design, a romantic style for home interiors and a more rational, business-like style for offices. Working-class families, however, were tied to the city and destined to live in reduced circumstances in urban slums. From a middle-class perspective, however, these poor man's hovels could not qualify as proper homes, as they were dirty, messy and smelly. A proper home had to be neat and tidy with a housewife who is in control of her household, who is caring, cleaning and cooking. In other words, the cultural meaning of home is molded by a middle class history and a gender ideology in which men were breadwinners and women were mothers and housewives. The cultural meaning of home with all its middle class ideals of tidiness, control and harmony became even stronger in the 20th century when urbanistic solutions for the housing problems of the working classes were modeled on the suburban ideal of the middle classes. It was in fact a clear-cut strategy to undermine the revolutionary spirit of the working classes. Romantic garden villages were designed to keep the workers happy and introduce them to the neat and tidy middle class ideology of the home. From a feminist perspective, however, the dominant ideology was to blame for imprisoning women and children in the green suburbs and in restricting the public presence of females under the guise of protecting women and children from the urban evils. The rising labor participation of married women in the post-war period was only a minor attack on the gender ideology of the home as working women also abided to the spatial separation <coughs> of the domains of home and work. In the 21st century, the domains of home and work may not be as gender specific anymore or as strictly separated as before, but they still play a major role in society as well as in individual life histories. The cultural and the personal meaning of home still thrives on its opposite. Okay, we have the opposite. And the opposite is the non-home, so to speak. For adults, the non-home will be work. For children, it will be school. The non-home gives meaning to the home, which is very evident in the case of the unemployed, for whom the home may lose its positive connotation. Of retreat, of retreat and become more of a punishment and a prison. However, the meaning of home also crumbles when the domains of home and work fuse, like in the case of the many self-employed men and women working from their home. 
in. Home is in essence a place you want to return to. As such, it gets more meaning the longer one has been separated from home. The homesick feelings of migrants and refugees testify to this. But I have to remind you that labor migrants left their home countries in search of work and not in search of a new home. The fact that children are more prone to homesickness than adults demonstrates the age-relatedness of the personal meaning of home. Children depend on the actions of their parents and have far less control over the home. <coughs> Still, homesickness is the most extreme expression of the personal meaning of home. But it is the meaning of the past home, of the home one left behind. Susan Matt's book on homesickness is a wonderful piece of historical research on the expressions of homesickness in 19th century letters written by American immigrants to their families back home. I can really recommend this book for your research on migrants. Now, personal meaning. This is a full uh, uh, slide. So the personal meaning of home depends first and of all on age and biography. What children mean by home is different from adolescents who have left the parental home to set up a household of their own. Well, for today's working parents, who often struggle to find a time balance between the domains of home and work, home primarily means the time they spend with their children, not only at home, but also outside the home. The personal meaning of home also changes in later life, especially for elderly, who due to physical limitations have become homebound. Therefore, the personal meaning of home is not fixed in time and space, but will be redefined over the life course when circumstances change. <clears throat> when questioned about the meaning of home, even young children prove to be capable of expressing multiple dimensions of the personal meaning of home. I've put in there the dimensions in the, in, on the bottom part. <clears throat> Um, their answers, when questioned about the, the meaning of home, their answers varied from home is where mom and dad are, in which they address the all-important convivial, that's number two, dimension of home, to home is where my toys are, in which they address the material dimension of home, number one. <coughs> To most people, home has a primary material dimension of a dwelling with some comfort of furnishings and devices, but certainly with a bed to sleep in. <clears throat> From the perspective of young children, however, there is no home when home alone. To them, the convivial home, the presence of one or more meaningful others, supersedes the material dimension of the home. Homesick feelings of children often pertain to the missing of parents or siblings. The answers of school children presented an even wider variation. In home is where my bedroom is, they address the privacy dimension of home, which is also the dimension adults appreciate so much. <clears throat> and in the answer, home is where my friends are, they address the neighborhood dimension of the wider home. The importance of the wider home or the neighborhood dimension for the well-being of children is widely acknowledged. A safe environment to play and make friends motivates many parents in their search for a new family home. And as such, it resonates the 19th century motivation of the Victorian middle classes to move to the suburbs. But more importantly, it illustrates that home, not only for children, <coughs> but also for adults, has a much wider meaning dimension than domestic space or the interior, as it may encompass a neighborhood or even a home country. However, also the importance of each of the dimensions of the personal meaning of home is age-related. 
<clears throat> when leaving the parental home to reside on their own, adolescents start a lifetime cycle of home, of home redefinitions, as they have to reinvent home in different locations, with or without a significant other. <clears throat> Initially, the material dimension will play a more prominent role in their personal creation of home, soon followed by the privacy dimension. <clears throat> when creating a family, the convivial dimension of the neighborhood di and the neighborhood dimension will become more important. However, the childhood home will be a primal point of reference throughout one's life, whether one loved it or hated it. <clears throat> Memories of the childhood home. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Memories of the childhood home are tied to all meaning dimensions of the home, but in particular to the convivial dimension and the related family practices. Not only mundane practices of having dinner together or watching television, but also the more ritual practices of celebrations. <coughs> However, however, even a shared childhood home, like in the case of brothers and sisters, does not automatically result in the same personal meaning of home. The youngest child has a different position than the oldest child, like girls have other exp experiences than boys. <clears throat> Histories of abuse or domestic violence, or the death of a parent or a sibling, have an enormous impact on the memories of a childhood home. <clears throat> home, you have to realize that home may be a very scary place for a child. I was really convinced of that after uh, a child officer uh, told me about the enormous number of victims of uh, child death in, in the UK simply by domestic violence. And when uh, a, a, a child officer said to the, uh, to the child, I'll bring you home, the child suddenly began to shiver, for home was not a safe place at all. It was the place where you... Um, where you got hit by your father. Or While the home is the home ideal, is to create, and the home ideal is to create a safe haven and an harmonious family life with loving parents in control. Statistics on child abuse and domestic violence, violence present another reality. <clears throat> the home ideal, although molded on 19th century middle class ideas, has become the shared cultural meaning of home. But the personal meaning of home is never really shared. That's the difficulty with the personal meaning of home. It's so tied to your own biography. <clears throat> Even couples who love each other may realize that inventing home together with someone with very different childhood home experiences will be, different, will be difficult. Clashing tastes and clashing practices can put an enormous strain on a young couple's relationship. <clears throat> In other words, not only the cultural meaning of home, but also the personal meaning of home has a historical dimension in which memories of past homes interact with the present. Especially memories of the childhood home are stored in senses, which means that a certain smell or a sound can revive memories of domestic practices, like mother baking cookies or playing the piano. <clears throat> practices of all sorts are vital in keeping the dimensions of the personal meaning of home alive. Not only domestic practices to activate the convivial dimension, but also demarcation practices to activate the privacy dimension of the home like the shutting of doors and the closing of windows. Also, the meaning of the wider home needs to be activated in practices. Feelings of unsafety towards the wider home of the neighborhood are expressed in doors with multiple locks and barred windows, 
and activated by practices of locking and retreating. While feelings of neighborhood safety are expressed in collective practices like decorating the street on festive occasions. <clears throat> No water anymore. <laughs> she's she's, being she's really bad. good. Okay. <clears throat> the meaning of home will change or will become devoid of meaning when the sustaining practices are no longer performed. <laughs> that will most certainly be the case with refugees who fled their home country and who lost most of their meaningful homes. But they did not only lose their material home, but often also their convivial home. In the refugee camps, they most certainly lost the privacy dimension, and also their former wider home environment of neighbors and friends, and the language community of their compatriots, and last but not least, the familiar natural environment of the landscape. <coughs> and they even lost the meaningful opposite of home, their work or school. Memories of home left behind will most likely develop into homesickness, but there is no cure for their homesickness when there is no home to return to. Labor migrants, however, have come to Europe to earn money in order to sustain their extended families in their home country. <coughs> Europe will build their work-related domain, but not the home place they are longing for. Their homing process in Europe... Oh, thank you. <coughs> sorry, sorry. <coughs> Their homing process in Europe might therefore be half-hearted, for the true home remains the family or village they left behind. The loyalty to the home country and to the family left behind that may extend over generations. A family network nowadays is supported by modern ICT networks, like Loretta Baldassar explained in this seminar. <clears throat> Dreams of future homes will keep the spirits of most migrants and refugees alive, but their future home will stress different meaning dimensions. For most labor migrants, the dream of a future home will be the construction of a more beautiful material home in their native village, while for families living in refugee camps, the dream of a future home will most likely be a more comfortable, but most of all a safe, convivial home with sufficient family privacy in a welcoming, wider home environment. <coughs> A lifetime cycle of reinventions of home in different locations may have become the predicament of most people on the globe today. Expats, exchange students, the commercial elite, they all have become part of the shifting population of com cosmopolitan nomads. <clears throat> However, in contrast to refugees, they choose to do so because it's part of their job or they want to improve their career opportunities by studying at a prestigious university abroad. In other words, their nomadism is motivated by the meaningful opposite of home, work. Mobile phones, smartphones and tablets have become the portable home connections not only for migrants and refugees, but for most of us. But even if you don't change countries, but move house in the same city or country, your future home should be better than the present. Each reinvention of home in another location should ideally be an upgrade, a more beautiful, a bigger house on a better location. Only misfortune, like a divorce or an unemployment, can spoil the ambition. <clears throat> I hope to have made clear to you that the concept of home defies easy definitions, not only because it's layered and multifarious on a personal level, but more so because it's deeply ingrained in Western culture and societal organizations. Western culture and society thrive on the emotional, social and spatial opposition between the domains of home and work. Home is one of the core concepts of Western culture 
because its cultural meaning is the outcome of a historical development towards the progressive separation of two domains represented in the urban domains of consumption and production as the respective domains of living and work. Therefore, home and work also represent two separate economic spheres, the non-profit labor in the domestic domain of the home and the wage labor in the public domain of the economy. The present cultural meaning of home, although less gender-specific, is still infused with 19th century notions. Home and work are not only still in opposition to each other, but they are also interdependent and mutually constitutive categories. How much you earn will determine the type of house you can afford. I hope to have made clear that home is first of all a historic condition related to industrialization and urbanization and as such typical of Western societies. I also would like to stress that the home conception of non-Western migrants might be very different from ours. The intensified ICT connections with the home and the family left behind may even prevent migrants and refugees from emotional investment in the host country. But that might be something you could find out in your research on homing. So I am very curious to learn more about your research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.